If you're old enough to remember Video 8 tape, it's more than likely you'll think of it as a camcorder format. And whilst it was, if Sony had had their way, it would have been so much more. It would have done away with VHS tape and taken over the whole home video cassette recorder market. So that's what I'll be talking about at the start of the video, going into the history of Video 8 a little bit. But then I'm going to move on to do some demonstrations, show you some Video 8 tape being played back on a couple of pieces of equipment. And one of those in particular is a fascinating little device. I'd never seen it before. I picked it up about a month or so ago. Looking online, it seems to be particularly rare. It's a little bit crazy as well. Nothing like it has ever been made before or since. So hopefully that's enough reason for you to stick around and watch the rest of the video. So let's get on with it. Before we can talk about Video 8, we first have to go back a little bit further and talk about Betamax, because Sony brought that out in 1975. It was designed to be a home format, and the cassettes were supposed to be about the size of a paperback book. Sony had developed an earlier video cassette format called U-Matic, but it wasn't really suitable for home use. It was very expensive as well, although it later found favour within the broadcast community. So Betamax was supposed to be an industry standard. Sony got the other manufacturers at the time, got them in, demonstrated the technology to them and tried to get them to sign up. So there's going to be one home video cassette format. But unfortunately, skullduggery was afoot because JVC and Matsushita, who'd seen the Sony demonstrations, rather than agreeing to become partners, instead went away and came back with their own rival system called VHS. And so began the battle of Betamax versus VHS. Now, VHS was cheaper to produce because the internal mechanisms were less complicated. And additionally, there were quite a number of different manufacturers producing VHS machines, which brought the price down, whereas Sony were pretty much the only ones that stuck with Betamax after a while. So when this catalogue came out in 1984, VHS is very much already on top. If you look through the list here, you can see there's only one Betamax machine mentioned there. In fact, there's one V2000 machine below that as well, and all the rest are VHS. Now, while Sony kept producing Betamax machines for a number of years after that, I think you can effectively say the war was over in July 1988 when Sony introduced their first VHS format machine. But behind the scenes, Sony had intended to replace Betamax a lot earlier than that. Just a few years after Betamax came onto the market, they were already working on their next generation format. And they gave their engineers in 1979 the task of producing a video cassette tape that was the same size as an audio cassette tape with the intention of developing a next generation VCR for the 1980s. And that's exactly what Video 8 was supposed to be. It made its way onto the market in 1985. The 8 in the title refers to the 8mm wide tape inside the cassette, and the overall size of the cassette is, of course, a lot smaller than a VHS tape. And if Sony had had their way, rather than it being a battle of Betamax versus VHS, they wanted a battle of Video 8 versus VHS. Another technology that Sony had been working on at the same time was the CCD. This little chip would allow for much smaller video cameras. So they teamed the CCD with the Video 8 tape mechanism and launched the first products that used Video 8 tape, which were a range of camcorders. There was the CCD V8, which was a traditional camcorder offering record and play, and then a smaller device which could only record. Now, of course, if you have a machine that can only record, you'll need something to play those tapes back on, so they also launched a range of Video 8 home video recorders. Sony's plan for Video 8 was to use the video cameras as a Trojan horse. People would buy the video cameras because of their compact size, and then when it came to replacing their video cassette recorder at home, they decide to go for a Video 8 tape machine instead of a VHS one. Initially, Sony were very bullish about the potential for the Video 8 products. At the bottom of the screen here, it says, As the pioneer in this field, Sony expects to establish market leadership by developing and marketing a wide range of innovative and attractive products. 
So, why didn't this happen? Well, there's a couple of reasons. One, the machines were very expensive, the home recorders, especially compared to VHS. But also, the capacity, the recording time was a lot less than VHS. If you look at this screen here at the top, PAL and NTSC. If we look at the PAL numbers, on the right, short play mode, which is your normal one, 90 minutes. I think that's the longest tape you could get in the PAL region. But notice below, in NTSC, that 90 minute tape will last for 126 minutes. So you get longer recording time if you're in the NTSC region. Now you can see in the NTSC regions, rather than opting to sell a 126 minute tape, they've taken a little bit off it, rounded it down to 120 minutes, which equals 85 minutes in the PAL regions. But that's the maximum length of tape you could buy. Of course, it will record longer in long play mode, but you'll lose some of the quality. 120 minutes is fine for a camcorder, but not so brilliant for a home video cassette recorder. So length and cost are concerns, but the next one is perhaps even more of a problem for Video 8. No sooner had it been launched than JVC came out with their own compact version of the VHS tape called VHSC. Let's just take a moment to compare Video 8 with VHS-C. Starting with VHS-C, the tape used inside here is the same width as standard VHS tape, which means the cassette is quite thick, but it also means it has the massive advantage that you can play this tape back in a normal VHS machine with the appropriate adapter. However, the disadvantage is that the maximum recording time is only 45 minutes in the PAL region on one of these cassettes. Whereas, of course, the Video 8 tape is a lot thinner which means you can make smaller camcorders that use this and of course we've got the maximum record time of 90 minutes here in the UK. One advantage that Video 8 has is sound. The quality of the sound is much better than standard VHS analog tracks. Now VHS Hi-Fi was introduced in 1984 and if you use a VHS Hi-Fi recording and compare that to a Video 8 tape they'll sound pretty much the same but VHS Hi-Fi didn't tend to get used on the camcorders. So if you just take away the ease of playback for the moment and just think about recording on a camcorder Video 8 tape pretty much had the advantage. You could record for longer, the tapes were small smaller which meant you could potentially have a smaller camcorder and the sound quality was much better. A disadvantage of that smaller size tape though is that it was a bit more prone to dropouts which led Sony to introduce things like an anti-static lid on their cassettes. So over the next few years, Video 8 became a successful camcorder format. But unfortunately for Sony, that didn't then migrate into the home as they'd originally planned for Video 8 to become a replacement for VHS. People were quite happy to keep their camcorders and their video players separate. So they thought they were going to have a Video 8 versus VHS battle. It ended up being Video 8 versus VHS-C in the camcorder arena, which over the years then changed into Hi-8 versus SVHS-C. And no doubt, much to Sony's chagrin, Video 8 wasn't the video format of the 1980s. No, that was the job of good old VHS from 1976, the format that they thought had pretty much ripped them off. There's one legacy of Sony's ambitions for Video 8 to become a home format that not everyone is aware of, and it's pre-recorded Video 8 cassettes. These ones here are all music titles, which of course will take advantage of the excellent sound quality that Video 8 provides, but you can of course also get children's cartoons or full Hollywood movies. Now, I find these fascinating. There's always something really attractive that draws the eye about a packaging design that you're used to seeing in a larger format, for example, a VHS tape, but then it's been shrunk down to something this size. And it's a nice little setup. You get a cardboard box, you get this plastic box inside. The whole thing is very neat. And I've got to say, if the titles I bought on VHS were available on Video 8, throughout the 80s and 90s and I'd had the appropriate Video 8 equipment at home, it's more than likely I'd still have those tapes now, whereas the big bulky VHS collection that I amassed during that time, unfortunately I had to give away when I started collecting DVDs in the late 1990s. Oh, and if you're wondering what I was pointing at on those tapes, it was just to show that the first one, Lethal Weapon, was in NTSC, but the last two, including Return of the Jedi, are in PAL format. But what am I going to play them back on? Well, how about one of these? Now, this is something that I really wanted back in the day. This came out in 1989. As you can see, it was £799.99. Well, at least it's not 800 But still, at that price, I couldn't afford it. On an inflation calculator, that works its way up to over £2,000 now. Unlike some of the later video Walkman, this one had a television tuner built in, so you could watch the TV, but it was also able to record off the TV, so you could time shift the programs and watch them later on your commute. 
commute. However, you could only get through approximately 50 minutes before the battery would run flat. But that would have been enough time to play back one of these. Now, this is a video magazine. Nowadays, you'd think nothing of watching a video on demand on your mobile device as long as you've got reception. However, with this, you had to go along with whatever they'd chosen for you. In this case, this is about New York, going on about the food clubs, films, etc. And you get a total of 30 minutes on one tape. And this ran for about six or seven issues. You can see here that you could subscribe to it. You get a bi-monthly issue. So every two months you get 30 minutes and it will cost you $6.99 each. But back to the playback equipment. Unfortunately, that first video Walkman is almost impossible to find in working order nowadays. They all seem to have self-destructed. So I purchased a video Walkman from the 1990s. Now this one's Hi8 compatible. It's only a player. You can put wires out though so you can capture video out or put it out to a TV. And it uses a lithium battery cell on the back here. And I've bought a separate one of these. As you can see it sticks out quite a bit. But when I charged that up fully it said it would give me about 800 minutes of playback time. So that's a bit of an improvement over that first model. Model. But yeah, it's just a simple model. This There's no recording on here. There's no TV tuner. All we can do is put tapes in it and play them back. The idea with these later machines is really to play back tapes that you'd recorded on your camcorder. I believe this is the largest screen that they put out on a Hi8 video Walkman. Now, Hi8 is the latest standard which has a higher resolution, 400 lines as opposed to the 250 or so of the original Video8 format, which is roughly the same as VHS. Before I play anything, let's just look into what titles were available on the 8mm format. Well, initially, the first releases in 1985 in Japan were all music-based titles because the tapes weren't long enough to hold a feature-length film. But by 1986, longer tapes had been developed and Sony got some movie studios to sign up and agree to release their films on Video 8. Ironically, the main advantage that 8mm had over VHS, which was size, was a disadvantage at retail because the retailers were concerned about stocking movies on such a small tape that could be easily pilfered off the shelves, and beside which they weren't particularly interested in stocking any more formats, regardless of the size. So with the exception of some Sony stores and larger music retail outlets, 8mm retreated to being sold mail order. And by 1991, it seems like the best place to buy 8mm tapes from was Columbia House, which, if you don't know, tended to specialise in end-of-line products. So how many titles came out on the 8mm format? I'm not entirely sure. I've seen some numbers around about 1,800 from the 1990s. However, I don't know whether that includes the Japanese releases, so I don't think we'll ever know the final number. Now, the three titles I've got here all came out in the 1980s, so I set myself a bit of a challenge. I wanted to see what the most recent film was that I could get hold of on 8mm. And I managed to find this one, Virtuosity. Now, this film came out in 1995 at the cinema. But if we have a look at the tape inside, we can see that the copyright on the tape is 1996. Now, this is the most recent film I've been able to find in retail packaging. However, I've got some others. These films here came out in 2000 and 2001. Now, if you just look at these two, you'll notice something on the right here. I'm sure some of the viewers will know what these two words mean. And you might have guessed where the tapes have come from by reading those, but I'll flip it over and this might give it away. That says out and that one says home. And uh, what does that mean? Well, of course, it means that these came from an airline. In this case, Novair. Now, these might look like they've been pirated, but they won't have been. It'll just been a very small production run. Probably just these two tapes produced for this particular airline with subtitles on them. I looked up Novair online the other day, and it appears they only have one plane in their fleet at the moment, but they've got a couple more coming online soon. But I'm sure they wouldn't have been concerned about having photocopied inserts on their tapes. Now, this one I am a little bit more interested in, not because of the film, although it's a great film and everything, it's because it's on Hi8 tape. Now, as far as I'm aware, no film has ever been released in the Hi8 format, so I'll be interested to try this one out because Hi8 is supposed to have a resolution that's approximately the same as a laser disc at around 400 lines. Now, there was one thing that I really wanted to find out, and that's when airlines stopped using 8mm tape. So I found this publication online from 2013, and in here you can see that Delta Airlines say they're still using videotape in-flight entertainment systems on some of their fleets. So that's 2013. 
and a chap from American Airlines say that he's going to swap over the 8mm systems by the end of the year, but some aircraft will continue using it until mid-2015 when they're retired. In my case, it's approximately 19 years ago that I stopped buying new movie releases on videotape. But little did I know, if I got on a plane as recently as 2015, I might have been watching my in-flight entertainment that was coming from a Video 8 tape. And it's quite possible there are still some airlines out there, some of the smaller ones, that are still using the equipment. I can understand, though, why they didn't bother spending the money on upgrading, because on a screen of this size, the video quality is totally acceptable. It's only when you go larger it starts to look a bit soft. Now, this particular player doesn't have any inbuilt speakers. You have to use a headphone socket if you want to hear it. And also, look at the bottom right of the screen there. I've got 520 minutes left on that battery there, and that's been run down quite a bit. So what I'll do, I'll capture some video off some of these tapes now and put it into here so you can see the proper quality. Who are you? Riggs, homicide. Come on, let's smoke, okay? Yeah. Go on, take it. Yeah. We're gonna take our time and both die of cancer. I don't want to play too much of that for copyright reasons, but I'm sure you can see that the video quality is roughly the same as VHS. But let's try this Chocolat tape out now, because if anything, this should be a higher quality, being on high 8 tape. But as you can see, it isn't, and that's because it isn't a high 8 recording. It's just a standard video 8 recording, but using a high 8 blank tape which is a bit of a disappointment. I was hoping I got the only high eight movie in existence, but on this occasion, it doesn't turn out that way. As you can see, it's actually a little bit soft and that'll be because it's been played an awful lot of times on that airplane. Now, I did own a Video 8 camcorder in the 1990s, and this is one of the tapes I recorded on it at the time. Now, this, of course, is in the PAL format. So if I play it back on this NTSC machine, this is what happens. So I've got a couple of PAL tapes I'd like to try and play, and I'm going to play them on something a bit different. You see, all the video Walkman are pretty similar design. You get the tape player at the bottom, the fold-up screen at the top, and they carried on this design all the way through to HDV, which is the high-definition DV format. But the thing I'm going to show you now is something a little bit different. This is the Video Compo. Now this setup came out in 1990, which is just the year following the launch of the first Video Walkman. But this is a completely different idea. What we've got here is a modular system. So you buy your stereo video cassette recorder and then you add on the parts you need. So you can have an LCD screen and a TV tuner, and you can also buy a small video camera, which attaches to the video cassette recorder by means of a cable, which of course means that your video camera can be quite a bit smaller and lighter as a result. Now I haven't got the camera but I've got the video recorder, the TV tuner and the LCD screen so I'll show you how all three of these things function and how they all fit together. So first off you put the TV tuner on the bottom if you want to use it that is and then put the video cassette recorder on the top and those things just hold together with this screw here. And then on the bottom of here, I'll just show you, we've got a battery backup. That'll be for the TV tuner and the clock setting that's in there. And then if we just spin around the back here, you can see we've got plenty of plugs and sockets on there. It's crazy, really. But what I'm going to do is plug that one into there. So that's the TV tuner going into the video recorder there. That's where you'd plug the camera in if you had one of those. And then this lead goes into the headphone lead there. So those two things are now joined together. This wire here, the AV out wire, is going out to the TV screen. So this is quite a long cable and on the other end of this I'm going to plug in my LCD screen. So you can see this cable just pops into the back of that socket there. These are all proprietary sockets so if you haven't got one of these cables you're going to have a bit of trouble finding one. Right, so the other thing we need to do is put some power into this. I don't have a battery for it. However, I've got this adapter here. This goes in place of the battery and just clips onto the side of the device there. Of course, the whole idea of this thing is that it is supposed to be portable, so you can run the whole thing off a battery. But what I'm doing here, I'm going to be running it off the mains power through the charger and then into the wall supply. So let's switch it on and have a look at it. So Looking at the top of the screen here, you can see we've got quite a few buttons. The power's on the left. If we slide that in, we can see the screen comes on. And then we'll just go through the other buttons here. We've got the on-off data and counter reset. You can see I can put the screen on there. 
And then across the top, these are the transport controls. And behind there, on the right, we've got a brightness wheel. And then if we flip it around on the back here, there's a dial to adjust the color. On this side, we've got mega bass and volume. And on this side, we've got a headphone out. Again, this thing doesn't have a speaker on it. We've got a tripod screw mount on the bottom and then two rubber feet. So the thing can just stand up like this. You could perhaps use that tripod mount to mount it in a car or something on the back of a headrest, or you could just use this little kickstand on the back. Now, the bottom item here, the tuner, does have an infrared remote control. It's got its own little power switch there as well. Behind this flap here are the controls to use it as a normal video recorder. So you can set timed recordings off this, which will, of course, record off that tuner. Tuner. And then on the right hand side here, we can go through the channel settings. And then over on the right here, you can't really see these, but there's a few more buttons there for setting the clock and doing a couple of settings on that tuner. So we'll just spin it around and have a look at the other side. You can see on the back here, we've got the aerial in and the video out. Headphones again on the bottom. There's some switches on the top there as well. It's amazing how many switches there are. There's one that goes between the camera and the tuner. There's a control switch, a uh, plug, I should say. There's another switch behind there, buried behind that lead. Record mode, short play, a long play. Also video out from that one at the top. It's a completely mad device, this really. In fact, I think I counted 40 individual dials, buttons and switches on this device between the screen and these two components here. Completely mad, but absolutely brilliant as well because just they don't make things like this anymore for good reason as well. Got a little LCD screen at the top there for the counter. We've got buttons on the left here for the video transport controls, which of course are duplicated on the LCD screen. It's just a completely mad little device from Sony. Sony at their best where they just did whatever they wanted. And I doubt you've ever seen one of these before, I know. I hadn't. Now it's particularly difficult to make videos about old video equipment because it doesn't tend to work. This thing does work, fortunately, although I can tell it's not very happy about it. It does make a few whirring and whining sounds, so I kind of think it's on its way out. But luckily we've caught it just in time to be able to make this video about it before it finally kicks the bucket. As you can see here, this is a video that I recorded in 97. That was my car at the time, that MR2. I miss that car, very nice little car, although it'll be in a scrapyard by now, unfortunately. And here's me in 1997. Now I was trying to do a bit of acting here, and as you can see, I'm not particularly good at it, but that was my video collection at the time there. I leave the acting to the the, uh, Muppets now it's better off if they do it they seem to be a little bit better than I am the eject mechanism on this video cassette recorder is particularly elaborate the way it moves forward and then pops up of course that will be to keep it as compact as possible but when you look in here the components really are crammed in it's a wonder that this thing works at all but let's play back a proper tape on this now so I'll put Return of the Jedi in here one thing I will say the video quality of this device isn't quite as good as the later model that I've got. It's a bit softer, a bit sort of blown out in places. But notice I can control the tape by using the controls on the screen. So you could put your video cassette recorder in your rucksack and just have this screen out and watch your film from there. Notice also bottom right, it says long play. So this tape has been recorded in long play. So the video quality of that will again be a little bit reduced from a, a standard play tape. <laughs> No, Chewbacca. Chisa, Pizza, Wanky Chewbacca. You're coming with me. I'll not leave you here. I've got to save you. You are ready. So I hope you've enjoyed this look at Video 8 Tape. Perhaps you've picked up a couple of bits of information about things that you didn't have before. For example, most people think that Video 8 Tape was just for camcorders. And they didn't realise that it ever made its way into the home in the shape of video cassette recorders. And especially in pre-recorded movies. And in particular, how long those movies continued to be released for after the format had seemingly disappeared. And then onto its zombie-like status as a life-after-death format that continued to be used on in-flight entertainment until very recently. 
But even if all that was old news to you, I hope you've got some enjoyment out of seeing the Sony Video Compo in action. Not only does it have a strange name, it's an even stranger device. Get those wonderful toys. But that's it for the moment. As always, thanks for watching. Oh, oh, he's done it now! What are you on about now? He said Betamax! What's wrong with that? It upsets the people who pronounce it Betamax. But the letters B-E are pronounced B, as in I'd rather be talking about something else right now. No, it depends where you come from. You know Greg from Australia? Yeah, he comes in the pub every now and then. He looks after the computers at the school. Yes, have you ever heard him say the word data? Aye, it's such a shame about that. About what? When they had that terrible flood at the school and he lost his daughter. He doesn't have any children. Well, not since the flood. No, you don't understand. He pronounces the word data as data. The flood destroyed the computers. Oh, flippin' heck. I bet he's wondering why I sent him flowers now.